right. So, um, so our conversation today, uh, obviously related to genocide. We reviewed this with the eight pages yesterday in the article that I gave you to read. I just want to preface this, and I think I've already prefaced this before when we started talking on Monday about where we are heading with this week, but I just want to reiterate that, like, the conversations that we have about genocide or the conversations we're going to have about the steps or the stages to full-blown genocide, as well as the definition, maybe like slightly uncomfortable, may give you the heebie-jeebies, but it's super important to talk about, right? The conversation is not aimed to make you feel uncomfortable. It's not aimed to make you feel guilty. So if you're feeling that way, just kind of step back and evaluate the bigger picture. The reason that we're having this conversation or the reason that we take some time to talk about genocide and specifically these eight stages is because it helps us be a better global citizen, right? One of our goals in world geography is to help us gain a better connection through a variety of different things. So if we can understand the eight stages of geography and how they've looked like, or sorry, eight stages of geography, eight stages of genocide, and we can show those examples of how we've seen them in the past, we can recognize not only what people have gone through who have lived through genocide, but also like how we can look to the future and prevent those things when we see it happening, that we can speak out against these injustices that are happening with genocide and with these eight stages, okay? So again, it's not aimed to make you feel uncomfortable. It's not aimed to make you like feel guilty or sad or anything like that. It's just a conversation that's super important that's worth having, okay? So with that being said, genocide is uh, just kind of like Skylar said, how is there eight stages, right? What do you mean there's eight stages of genocide, okay? Well, genocide is really complex, okay? Um, and we know this just because the definition of genocide is super complex, okay? So the definition from the United Nations of genocide is this long thing right here, okay? I know I normally tell you to paraphrase or to, uh, uh, to shorten it down, but I want you to try and, you know, I'll give you as much time as you need to do the whole definition, okay? So the definition from the United Nations of genocide has two different parts, okay? The first part is about, like, what is genocide, basically. So in the present convention, so basically with the countries that are present within the United Nations, they have decided that genocide means any of the following acts excuse me, being committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, it will say ethnic, ethical, sorry, uh, racial or religious group uh, such as, and they give examples of these uh, malicious acts or these genocidal acts. Okay? So the first part talks about who it's aimed at or what kind of qualifies um, who could be targeted. So national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups with any intent to destroy in part or in whole those types of groups, okay? And then the second part of this definition talks about things that could be done that qualify as genocidal based on what we've just discussed, right? So intent to destroy in whole or in part, the number one on that list is killing members of that group, right? This is kind of what we think of when we're like, why is there eight stages? It's just murdering a bunch of people. No, there's a lot more that goes into it. That's just one way that you can commit genocide, but there's many different things that kind of fall underneath it, okay? So number one, killing members of the group. Number two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Number three, deliberately inflicting uh, on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. This is basically a longer version of saying if you are putting or if these people are putting this national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in a position in which they cannot survive or that they are being physically uh, destroyed, then that is also considered genocide. And the last two kind of go together in terms of like erasing a nationality or erasing one of these groups, imposing measures to prevent birth, and forcibly transferring children of that group to another group. So erasing their heritage as a member of that group, right? I know we're starting off strong with the writing, I'm sorry. So there's two different parts to this definition. One, who does it affect? And what to, why does it affect them, or how can it be affected, okay? I'm just going to give you silence for a second to finish up this definition. 
as you're finishing writing this, I want you to think about um, how precise this definition is. Okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind and we'll discuss in a second. I promise this is the longest slide you have for the day. None of the other ones come close to this. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, while you guys are finishing up that definition, I want you to reflect real quick. You can talk to the people around you, or you can reflect by yourself, whatever works. I prefer you to talk to other people, but, you know. Um, what I want you to think about, like I said, put it in the back of your mind, like, man, this definition is really precise. I wonder why it's so precise, okay? What I want you to think about is... Um, you know, talking with people around you, why do you think the United Nations makes such an effort to be very strict about this term? Like, it's super strict in its wording, it's very precise as it's defined. Why do you think the United Nations chooses to do that, okay? Don't worry about the second question because we've already heard of the eight stages of genocide from what we did yesterday. Just worry about this. Why do you think the UN and all the countries involved uh, make an effort to have that definition be very concise and very strict, okay? Talk for like a minute. It's fine. We'll get back together afterwards, but talk with people around you for like a minute, okay? <laughs> Why do you think the UN makes the definition so strict? Oh. oh, I thought I caught it. Yeah, 
All right, let's talk together. Somebody be brave. Why does the UN make such an effort to make sure that this definition is very precise, very strict? Yeah. Yeah, so like we need to make sure that it's very precise because it needs to check all of those boxes, right? If people don't know what is considered genocide, then that's a problem. So we got to make it as, as concise as possible, right? Why else might the UN want it to be very, very strict or very, very concise? Why else might the UN want the definition to be really, really strict? I know you have good ideas. You've got giant, huge brains. Go ahead, Shay. Um, so like, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going kind of back to the checking of the boxes, right? If somebody tries to argue with me that it's not genocidal act or if it's not participating in genocide, I can go back to that definition and say, hey, yes, you are, right? I'm covering my butt or I'm covering the butts of millions of people by saying, yes, you are committing genocide. I can hold you accountable to that, right? Um, another reason that we might want to think about, right, is um, let's, you know, let's kind of put it in perspective of maybe school or something, right? If the school has a really, really strict code on like parking or something, right? Especially with the construction going on, okay? Let's say they have really, really strict rules on parking. Like if you park in the wrong spot, you get a ticket. If you park in somebody else's spot, you get a ticket. If you park uh, longer in somewhere that you're not supposed to park, you get a ticket, right? Are you gonna keep parking there? Probably not, right? I don't wanna do those tickets. If you, you know, take somebody's spot and you get detention, are you gonna continue taking their spot? Probably not, right? So if I have really, really strict rules and really, really concise definitions, it deters people from committing those things, right? If I can clearly say, hey, this is definitely something that's genocidal, I won't do it, right? Or this country might be uh, uh, inclined not to participate, okay? Obviously, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's something to think about, right? All right, so... We answer that question on why did the United Nations think this should be very, very strict, and you guys came up with some really awesome things. Let's go ahead and get into the actual eight stages, okay? So we're just going to go through each one. I'll give you uh, examples specifically from Rwanda as we go through this because we're going to focus specifically on Rwanda for the next couple of days. But there are multiple different um, examples that you can give uh, when it comes to the eight stages, and I'll go back and forth a little bit, okay? So thumbs up, we're ready. Move on. Awesome. So... Eight stages of genocide are developed, uh, just a little bit of background information, is developed by this guy named Jeffrey H. Stanton, as well as the UN. And the reason it was uh, created, or the reason that it was developed, is because shortly after the Rwandan genocide in the, like, early to mid, uh, or excuse me, early to late 1990s, um, we realized that there was a pattern, basically, that was happening between uh, a lot of these genocides that we've seen throughout history. So it was produced shortly after the Rwandan genocide, and that's also why I'm going to give examples from Rwanda, because we can outline them very clearly. But you can also have examples when it comes to the Holocaust, the Cambodian genocide, basically any genocide you can see through history. Uh, Jeffrey Stanton is quoted as saying when talking about these eight stages of uh, genocide that they are predictable but not inexorable, meaning that just because we can predict, um, you know, how groups are treated on this genocidal um, uh, timeline does not mean that it is excusable. That just because we can predict what's happening or that we can pinpoint what's going on doesn't mean that the countries that are committing these things are excused of their actions. Okay? He also makes a point to talk about the fact that these stages can happen individually through time, through long periods of time, or simultaneously kind of all at once. So we can have one stage that took five years to get through, and then another that took one, and then another that took five, and then another, you know, it can happen individually on their own, but they can also happen very quickly, very simultaneously, hand in hand. 
just depends on the situation. So this is just the background information of why we have this in the first place and why it's a valuable tool that we can pinpoint the timelines of these genocides so that we can further um, like redact those from happening. All right, so let us go ahead and go through the stages then together, and I'll give you examples. I'll have a couple of clips and stuff that we can go through as well to give examples, um, but we'll just kind of dive right into it, okay? Uh, so the first stage of genocide, or the first of these eight stages, is classification. Classification is the first step because it is um, kind of not just only the easiest to pinpoint, but also the easiest to uh, carry out. Okay? Classification is simply dividing groups on those national, ethnic, racial, religious lines uh, from them or like into them and us. Okay? Most of the time we see racial and ethnic divides when it comes to this, but it could also be religious, as in the case of the Holocaust, with uh, basically Jewish um, versus Hitler, basically. But it's any time that we're dividing a them versus us. Okay? That division has to be clear and enforced. meaning there can't be any overlap. You can only be one or the other. Okay? So in Rwanda, the groups that are divided are the Hutu and the Tutsi. The Hutu are going to be the group um, committing these genocidal acts. The Tutsi are going to be the ones on the receiving end. But the classification makes it very clear that you have to be one or the other. There is no overlap. It has to be clear and enforced. All right, easy start. We're getting off to a good one, okay? Let's go ahead to move on to the second stage. Stage two of the stages of genocide is symbolization. Okay. Symbolization takes the, uh, the idea of classification, dividing them versus us, and asking the question, what about these people put them into each group? What defines, what symbolizes the people of either group to make them different, okay? So what is going on with this group to put them on this side? What are the characteristics they share versus what's going on on this side, the characteristics they share to put them over there, okay? You can symbolize using a variety of different things, both physical and cultural traits. So you can use um, like family names, basically. If you have a family or ancestral name that uh, leads you to one side or the other, it'll put you there, okay? Physical features, such as facial features, is something that you could use, okay? So my example that I have up here in Rwanda is that the Hutu and the Tutsi, they would put this out everywhere as a way to physically define one or the other. However, I do want to make it clear that, like, this is not scientifically accurate, okay? This is propaganda that was posed by the state. But either way, they're using facial features and physical features of, like, their skull shape and their face shape, et cetera, et cetera, to try and define them, to symbolize them as something different. 
We can also, if we're talking about facial features and like physical features, probably talk about the Holocaust of the quote unquote Aryan race that was supposed to be the superior race, blonde hair, blue eyed, white, right? Physical features that could deter somebody or that could put somebody in that group. You could also use clothing as a symbol, a cultural thing. The best way you guys can exemplify that is by like the Jewish armbands during the Holocaust that they're uh, displaying the Star of David as a way to symbolize them. Okay? So symbolization is all about creating that divide even further by attributing physical, cultural, et cetera, et cetera, things to either of those groups to separate them. <clears throat> so we classified the two groups, we symbolized who was in both of those groups, and the next step takes it a step further. So the next step in taking it kind of a step further after symbolization comes dehumanization. Dehumanization takes um, the symbols that you have attributed or that a country or a person, etc., has attributed to the groups and justifies these symbols and projects the inequalities between them. So, for example, if I was using like the Rwandan uh, method with um, face shape and facial structure, et cetera, et cetera, the difference between symbolization and dehumanization would me be going, well, yeah, the Tutsi, of course, have smaller heads because they're stupider. They have less brain. They have less brain power. They're dumber, okay? You're taking the symbols that you've attributed or that grunt that group has attributed and justifying it in some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> Dehumanization is often the point um, that like Jeffrey Stanton in the UN feels like there's not a whole lot of coming back from. That classification and symbolization can exist without genocidal tendencies. But dehumanization takes those symbols and takes those classifications and exploits them and launches it forward. Okay. Part of dehumanization as well, probably the most important part, is that you, uh, or excuse me, I shouldn't say you, the group that is uh, in control of this genocidal stage uh, make a great effort to make sure that these victims feel less than human. That if you uh, view them as less than human, if the group can make them feel less than human, then they will eventually start believing that they are less than human and start uh, being e easier to control. So I'll give you the example of Rwanda in just a second with these Hutu Ten Commandments uh, that were spread across the radio basically every day, multiple times a day, talking about how awful um, the Tutsi ethnic race was, um, that the women were untrustworthy, the men were untrustworthy, that Hutu people um, made better wives, made better business people, made better soldiers, et cetera, et cetera. They called them cockroaches, they called them insects, they called them vermin. That's another big um, indicator of dehumanization. And I'll, I'll refer back to that in a little bit. But basically this Rwandan radio said it so often and basically played it so often that the Tutsi people started to question like, maybe I am not that good, right? Maybe we are the non-superior race. Okay. If I came in the classroom every day and just told you guys how dumb you were every single day, I called you stupid and I called you idiots and I called you all these rude things. If I did it every single day for an entire trimester, 
you might start to believe it, right? I absolutely don't think you guys are stupid. I think you have 8,000 gigabyte brains. But if I started doing that, you might think you're stupid, right? Maybe I should do the opposite. Maybe I should just come in every day and be like, God, you guys are so smart. You have 8,000 gigabyte brains. You have so much brain power. You're awesome. I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> okay, so um, like I said, I'm going to show you the Hutu Ten Commandments that outline like the different things that were said about the Tutsi people uh, on this Rwandan radio station and just in general uh, for a multitude of years, basically continually pushed out to the public constantly, uh, one after another, after another. Okay. So the different things that were said, the different things that are said through the Hutu 10 commandments about the Tutsi people, um, every Hutu should know that a Tutsi woman, whoever she is, works for the interests of her Tutsi ethnic group. And as a result, we shall consider a tradie or a traitor basically. Okay. That Hutu women can't be trusted. They shouldn't be uh, marriage material. You shouldn't use them for any sexual purposes. You shouldn't use them as an employee. They are traitors and they will take everything that you have and bring it back to their Tutsi people. They don't work for you. They work for only themselves. Okay? That every Hutu should know that our Hutu daughters are more suitable and conscious in the role of woman. That Hutu women are the ones you need to be marrying and using for sexual endeavors and employing. Okay? That they're better. Uh, Hutu women, um, be vigilant in trying to bring back your husband's brothers and sons to the Hutu people. So if your brother married a Tutsi, you should try and convince him to leave her, to get away from her, to come back to his own people. Okay? Um, every Hutu should know that every Tutsi is dishonest in business, that you should not make any business partnerships, invest money, lend or borrow money, give favors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. To any Tutsi under any circumstances, because they will, you know, screw you over, they'll take your money, they'll swindle you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all strategic positions, political, administrative, economic, et cetera, should be entrusted only to Hutu. Tutsi should not be allowed to serve in the military. They should not be allowed to be higher ups in the military. They should not be allowed to start businesses. They should not be allowed to be elected to political office. They just can't be trusted. Um, all of the education sector needs to be a majority Hutu or they'll be getting the wrong information. Uh, they would recite these Ten Commandments in school just like we used to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. That's how deep it ran. Okay. Um, the Rwandan armed forces should be exclusively Hutu. Again, we're not letting them into the uh, military. No Hutu should stop having mercy on the Tutsi. Or excuse me, the Hutu should stop having mercy on the Tutsi. So don't feel bad for them. Don't feel sympathetic. They've done this to themselves. They know what vermin they are. Don't, don't feel bad for them. Um, and then it just goes on and on and on about how the Hutu are better than them in every way, shape, or form. That spiritually, logistically, et cetera, et cetera, the Tutsi should not be alive, okay? That every, on every level and anybody who disagrees with it is a traitor, okay? That's kind of the kicker at the end is every Hutu must spread this ideology and anybody who says no or anybody who like persecutes somebody for doing so is a traitor and like can't be trusted anymore. Okay? So not only are they creating and classifying and dehumanizing the Tutsi in this situation, they're saying if you don't agree with this, we're going to dehumanize you too. You get to be on the other side now if you don't buy into it. Okay? This is not the first time that we see things like this, but the Hutu Ten Commandments are kind of like the staple of where we see um, this kind of like disgusting language used to dehumanize somebody. Okay. Come on. All right, any questions about dehumanization? If you guys have any questions as we're going through the stages, please don't, be, I mean, please feel free to um, raise your hand or, you know, shout out your question, whatever you need to do, okay? All right, next stage is organization. Organization is, I'm, it's quite simply planning. Um, 
if a group is making any sort of plans for future endeavors, including those genocidal uh, acts, it falls under organization, okay? Um, planning and organization does not have to be elaborate. In this instance, in most instances, um, these groups don't feel killing is very complex. It doesn't need to be trained. It's something that as long as you, uh, as long as that group agrees upon it, then can be put into motion. Okay. This organization can happen at a small slash local level, as well as a uh, bigger level, like a uh, national level. Sometimes we get both as like Nazi Germany that we have like on a national level, we have Adolf Hitler perpetuating all of these things and physically training people uh, through the Nazi military. But we also have small groups uh, wandering throughout the German countryside, putting people into ghettos, turning people in, et cetera, et cetera. In Rwanda, when it comes to the organization stage, we can see um, a lot of forced participation into this organization. But there's also some voluntary because they feel like it's like the lesser of two evils. Obviously, there's really no such thing during the eight stages, but they don't know that at the time. Also in Rwanda, we see a training militia squad that's specifically designed to take out Tutsi uh, rebels, basically. They want to categorize them as rebels, as vermin, etc. Organization's not, um, it's a hard one to talk about. Organization sucks. Organization is when you can start seeing what's going to happen, but it's very, very hard to stop. All right, next up on the docket or next up on our stages is polarization. Okay. Once the group has decided how they are going to plan this out or how the timeline is going to work, polarization is the next logical step to keep the members of the persecuted group as far away from each other as possible as to deter um, riots, uprisings, and negotiations. So polarization is all about keeping them separated, keeping them frantic, spreading them further and further apart so that they can't come together and negotiate. So in a physical sense, in keeping them separated, spreading them farther and farther apart, in Rwanda, um, they are putting up roadblocks and stopping movement between villages. Okay? In Nazi Germany, they are um, pushing people into ghettos across town from where they used to live so that anybody who uh, may have had a contact will be separated and severed. You can also do things, or the group can also do things like committing polarizing actions. This is what I mean by keeping them frantic. So if I, or if a group, excuse me, if a group that's committing the genocidal acts decides to murder a bunch of high up officials, like let's say a president, or a prime minister, or a Supreme Court justice, et cetera, et cetera, um, it sends them into a panic. If you're losing your structure at the top, it's gonna fall, okay? Targeting well-known families, targeting civilians, targeting people who, um, you know, are making statements, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
that's how polarization works. So like I said, in Rwanda, they end up murdering uh, the chief Supreme Court justice who was Tutsi, the archbishop who was Tutsi, the prime minister that was Tutsi. They just go down the list of any high up Tutsi members and start murdering them. They also continue the propaganda over the radio to keep dehumanizing them, to make it seem like they can't ever like rise up or riot. Polarization is an interesting stage because there's many different things that a group could do to keep polarizing. And it's also like, I know it sounds like kind of graphic. It's so easy to do in most instances. If you've already gotten to the stage of polarization, that group, it's so easy to polarize a group of people who are already afraid, who are already pushed to the point of dehumanization and it's super it's very tragic at that point okay next stage it kind of goes hand in hand with polarization once you've kind of spread them uh, or once the group has spread them apart once they have um, completely polarized them or at least got them as polarized as possible it's time for preparation Preparation also comes in four stages. So one after the other after the other for like full preparation or full, um, what's the best word to use? Commitment, okay? First step is identification. Listing who the victims are, identify who the target is. Identification can come in many ways. You might have an identification card um, or they might have a, an identification card that labels them uh, or symbolizes them as the group who is being targeted. Uh, we can refer back to like the Jewish armbands. That's an identificator or an, uh, yeah, an identifi identificator, identification strategy, whatever, to show who is the victim. Next step is expropriation which is basically you take, or the group takes everything from them. Take away their property, take away their housing, take away their food, take away their jobs, take away their children, take away everything that they have so that they have nothing. A man who has nothing will be much more compliant than a man who has everything. Next step is concentration. Concentration is all about herding that victimized or herding that victimized group into a smaller space. When people are in smaller spaces, they are easier to control. Especially when those same people don't have anything. And then last but not least is transportation. In uh, Rwanda, it is taking people down specific roads to be um, separated and slaughtered. In Nazi Germany, it is transporting people by train to concentration camps, to gas chambers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's always the last step. I know this stage is probably like the most uncomfortable. So take a breath if you need to. Uh, I have a sh super short video. It's literally only like a minute and a half, okay? Um, of this woman who had survived the Rwandan genocide um, and how 
uh, her and her mother and a bunch of people around her basically were taken to these roadblocks um, and kind of what would happen at these roadblocks once you got kind of to the transportation portion, okay? Super short, it's not that bad, it's just a little video. This one, this one. The guy who was my guardian at this point, they gave him the red, the red book. And they were telling him that Tutsi here, Hutu here. If you know you're Tutsi, decide. If you know you're Hutu, decide. But uh, then I started to ask myself, why do I count myself? Do I go to my husband's side? Since I'm married to a Hutu, maybe I had the right to stay on his side. But then immediately, someone, one of the of the local people on the road group came and told me, hey, you don't belong to that side, even if you are married to him, just here. So I was pulled to that side, and uh, they started up with Bashet coming towards me. What I did, I raised up my arm, my hand, and I said, please, please don't him. As I was putting my hands up, the, my gardener came. I can't remember what it was, a, a slasher, or, but it was something sharp because it cut my hand. And uh, I fell down, and the uh, prior started shooting up. So my mother was trying to pull me up. They said they, they, had, they hit her heart, she fell down also. And uh, the gardener came and said, okay, please. She, he pulled me up, said, leave her alone, I'm the one going to kill her because she was, she, I was living for her and she, she was a very bad boss to me. She never paid me well, she never gave me food. In my mind, I thought I was going to be killed by him. He took us like my mother and the other three ladies and took us aside with the other bush, on which there he, he got some some leaves and burned it to my hand, my hand, and told us run, run for your safety. And he apologized, he said, please forgive me. This was the only way I can spare your lives. So as she described, I mean, luckily she is spared by this person who happened to know her, and it's the only way that he could do it. But once you've met that roadblock once if you know if i was in that certain um city village etc and i met that roadblock and i am herded to the tootsie side it doesn't always end up like this okay it doesn't end up like this almost ever okay so um that kind of leads us to the last stage or one of the last stages extermination okay. i don't want to spend a whole lot of time on extermination it's pretty straightforward it is the end all be all it's the end of the line the final solution um where the dominant group executes all of the organization and preparation that had been uh that had been done the only thing that i will say about extermination or the only thing that's important to note about extermination is that the reason it is called extermination the reason that they have categorized this stage as extermination not murder not genocide etc cetera, etc cetera, is because that's how it is referred to by the dominant group the perpetrator of these acts it's not murder to them murder would indicate human qualities that i'm or that somebody is taking a human soul that somebody is taking a human life but if you remember from dehumanization they're not human at least in the eyes of the perpetrator. They're insects, they're cockroaches, they're subhuman. So murder is not the word that they will ever use. They use exterminate because you exterminate vermin. Uh, in Rwanda, after this stage has been met or after this stage is put into motion, uh, by the end of it, the numbers are different based on the media outlet, but the death toll of Rwandan genocide is generally accepted at about a million people. Across the country of Rwanda and some neighboring countries. That's basically all there is for extermination. Not a whole lot else to it. We have one more stage that we're going to go through super quickly. Just making sure everybody's got the information.
Normally when I do this presentation and we are unfamiliar with the eight stages of genocide, people are always confused like, like, shouldn't this be the last stage? Like, it's done, right? Like, they've committed the genocidal acts, the, the murder has been, has been done. What else could there be, right? But if you think about it, again, being good global citizens, a million people died at the hands of their own, basically, brethren. There's an aftermath to that. Four million Jewish lives were taken throughout the Holocaust. There's an aftermath to that. There's got to be some kind of resolution, right? So just as there's an aftermath to what happens after the genocidal acts have been committed, there has to be another stage after extermination. And unfortunately, we don't really get a happy ending when it comes to these eight stages. The last stage is denial. That when we're talking about the perpetrators of these genocidal acts, it happens in every genocide, no exception in all of history that the perpetrators deny that any crime has ever been committed. Not before the actual extermination phase, not during, not after, not ever. They deny that it happened. This comes in two different ways, one of which is just straight up denying that it ever happened, being like, no, I don't know what you're talking about, what's the Holocaust, okay? That's one way. The other way is about twisting the truth, hiding evidence, uh, and denying that there was ever a crime committed. So an understanding is had that something has happened, but that what has happened was not a crime, okay? Uh, the perpetrators will often lie about numbers, so lie about the amount of people who have gone through this extermination phase, lie about the planning, lie about the organization. They argue about definitions. This is why I asked you at the very beginning why it's super important to have a strict definition. Because if a perpetrator doesn't think they've done anything wrong and they can't prove it within the definition, then there's nothing that you can prosecute them for, right? And we also see just straight up covering of the situation. So for example, in the Holocaust, after Hitler had committed suicide and Germany was being taken over by the allies, a bunch of high up Nazi leaders burned plans for the concentration camp. They burned them like they got rid of memorabilia and burned memorabilia from any of those places, trying to cover it up. Right. When it comes to Rwanda, all high ranking Hutu officials uh, in the aftermath of what happened after relief had came, um, deny that it ever happened at all. So basically they were like, what do you mean genocide? Nobody who has been killed here. Nobody had died. It never happened. So with genocide, we already kind of prefaced that it's not a super fun topic to talk about. We don't really get a happy ending either. But that's why we talk about it. That to be better global citizens, to see the point where we don't have to get to this denial, where we don't have to feel guilty and feel bad, that we can do something, is a better situation. Okay. That is all for today. If you've got that down, you can go ahead and put your notes away. If you missed anything, this will be on uh, YouTube by the end of the day. Otherwise, tomorrow and Friday, we will continue talking about Rwanda. Um, and that's it. Got a couple minutes left to yourself. Just hang out.